I'm one of the two facilitators with Harriet, who will introduce herself in a minute. So I'm a professor in knowledge exchange at Bristol Business School. Um, I'm a qualified coach and mentor myself, and I've been mentoring for quite a long time. I'm just really looking forward to getting going on this lovely program. Um, Harriet, shall I hand over to you? Because I think you're going to do the introductions, aren't you? Lovely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, lovely to be here. My name is uh, Harriet Shaw. I'm an associate professor in organisation studies at Bristol Business School at the University of the West of England. Um, I do a variety of uh, research and business engagement and teaching work, but um, a variety of my work is, is in the coaching and mentoring field. I'm former chair of our university wide uh, women in mentoring scheme, women in research mentoring scheme and um, have done a variety of uh, uh, included variety of roles in the coaching and mentoring space, uh, working on our undergraduate programs uh, with ILM for coaching in organisations. So, yes, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so now we've done uh, some of the introductions. Um, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview, really, of, of what we're going to be to be doing today. And this is your first introductory session um, to get you started um, on your mentoring relationship. So I hope you're looking forward to hearing more and thinking um, a, little, a little bit more about uh, what that might mean. Uh, the session offers some key areas for reflection. Um, for all mentors and mentees, we have both um, in the room uh, about to embark on setting up their mentoring relationships. So the session itself is going to um, allow for some small interactive um, discussions and activities in our online breakout rooms. We'll be having a short coffee break um, sort of halfway through the session or so. And um, I guess before we start, it would be useful to have with you your uh, workbook. We we sent through a workbook um, with some small uh, preparation activities within that. So if you have that with you, that's useful to have in front of you now. And you'll need some um, notepad and some pens um, as well for, for the activities that are coming up. So um, uh, Lawrence, is it you I need to ask for next slide, please? Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I guess to start off with um, this session's being recorded um, so we can pass it on to participants that, that can't make it today. But there's um, an element of, sort of trust and confidentiality that we want to um, to note. So particularly within your breakout sessions, we'd just like to um, take that uh, into that, that space and make sure that whatever we talk about in these sessions stay in these sessions um, and, and are not shared. People often share experiences or perhaps um, thoughts around their organisational life. Um, so we want to make sure that there is that shared understanding within the group that um, that we we remain um, uh, confidential within the, the topics of, that, we, that we talk about in those breakout rooms. So really, there are three themes um, that we are going to cover in this very first introductory session. We can say a little bit more at the end about the sorts of things that we're interested in um, bringing to you in subsequent webinars. And of course, it would be great to hear from you to understand what you might like from future webinars as well. Um, but in this first one, as I say, it's introductory. So we're going to start with an, an overview of the mentoring relationship. Um, and we're going to think about what mentoring means to you and give you some space and time to think about this. We're also going to think about ethics and the importance of contracting. So thinking about our expectations, whether you're mentor or mentee. And then finally, we're going to uh, get thinking about mentoring models or approaches that might work for you to, to really help you get started. This by no means um, covers all aspects um, or, uh, of mentoring and it doesn't cover sort of deep theoretical considerations in the field, but it's been designed for you to, to sort of get going and for you to meet each other, to provoke thought um, and get you started in some areas. So we hope the session um, will provide you with that sort of sense of reflection, um, shared expectations, thinking about what's important to you. Think of it as a protected space. I know you're all really busy people, time pressured. So think of this as a really protected space for you to sit and, and, and make some space to, to really think about um, how you can get the best out of this mentoring scheme. And of course, for those who have 
um, experience in mentoring already. I'm sure there's there are plenty of people in the room who perhaps have already come across some of the things that we might talk about today. We hope this will be a useful space for you to refresh, re, re, refresh your knowledge and your expertise uh, in some way as well. So that's the overview for today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Carol, who's going to kick off the session with our theme one on uh, the mentoring relationship and what it means to you. And I think that's over to the next slide. Lovely. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, Harriet. Um, can everybody hear me OK? Just put up. Yeah, good. Um, as you may or may not know, um, the idea about mentoring, the concept of mentoring has been around for, well, probably about 3000 years now. Um, it started out, apparently, um, at, it's named after a friend and advisor to Telemachus, who was Odysseus's son. Um, so it's got its first use in, in Homer's writing. Um, and from its roots, it actually means an, an advisor of thought. But although the concept's been around for a long time, it comes in very many different kind of um, shapes and guises. So it's not surprising that there are probably as many definitions of mentoring as there are people who've written about it. So we've just shared a couple here and another one in, in your workbook. Um, but I think really for me, what it is, it's about finding a definition or finding a meaning that works for the two people in your mentoring relationship. So it could be reading around the subject finding something that works, or maybe even working with your mentor or mentee to develop your own definition. I'm not going to read out the definitions here because I'm sure you can all see them on the screen. Um, but yeah, just think about what, what does mentoring mean to me? And I, I think for me, some of the kind of key words are about, it's about sharing experience. It's about a kind of professional friendship or a critical friendship. And most of all, it's about in, it's about the person being mentored, the mentee or sometimes called the protege and providing the encouragement for them. We asked you, I think, in the workbook to have some thoughts about um, the definitions and what they mean to you and to select some images. And we asked you to pick an image or a photo that captured something about what mentoring means to you. And we'll come back to that in a in a few moments. But um, first of all, let's let's have a, another little look. If you can put the next slide, Lawrence. Um, so there has been it's kind of patchy, but there's been quite a lot of research on on the benefits of mentoring. Um, and like I guess any good relationship and a, an effective mentoring experience is rewarding for both both the parties involved, the mentor. And, and the mentee. Um, for example, I guess sometimes the mentee will find themselves increasing in confidence, often maybe uncovering new career development opportunities, and perhaps increasing their job satisfaction. And I guess the same is true, can be true for mentors. Very often mentors find that they are not only getting more satisfaction from their own work and you know that 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 very developmental role is is rewarding in and of itself but also quite often it rejuvenates their careers a, a good mentor can and get can get a lot of benefit as much benefit i think as the mentee from the, the relationship and if we can have the next slide please lawrence so just a little bit about what a mentoring relationship might look like. As I said, there's many, many different ways, and we're going to look at a few more of them later in this session of mentoring relationships and, and the way that they can develop. But I think what's really important is to think about not just what mentoring is, but also what it isn't about. So um, a, a good mentoring programme, and certainly this programme, isn't about sponsorship. So it, it's not it's not about kind of promoting the individual or sponsoring a particular individual to, to go forward. It's much more about helping them to develop. And in particular, 
I think, but it's it's a it is about the the mentee, the person being mentored. It shouldn't be about the mentor and their ego. It's not a game playing exercise. Um, it's not about trying to create a clone, um, if you like, of the mentor to recreate the 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 mentee and the mentor's image. And it should be a, a supportive, collaborative relationship. It's not a competition. It's not one way. I think it's really important within, you know, from the beginning. And Harriet's going to come and look at this in the in contracting in a minute. But that it isn't one way. That it is a and and your e the mentor may be more senior, but in this relationship, you're equal partners. You contribute in different ways, but you contribute equally to making the relationship a success and that means that from the mentor's point of view you're not providing uncritical support to the person I, I like to talk about it as being something that's closer to what I call compassionate honesty so giving feedback that sometimes might be that's designed to develop the person um, so you know Part of a mentor's role might be to show the person the ropes, but it's about more than that. Um, it's about more than advising. Um, it's it's not. It's about more than passing on the torch or giving a person a competitive advantage. And from the mentor's point of view, it's about being more than a sounding board. So I think a really good mentoring relationship should be about this idea of critical friendship, and we're. We're going to send you um, a paper around. We'll circulate it after this session around friendship and mentoring, how that relationship works. Because ultimately, you know, a good critical friend has got your interests at heart. They want you to be the best you can be. So it, it's a developmental relationship. Um, a lot of the research shows that effective mentoring relationships, that sense of having similar shared values and a values alignment and being clear about expectations, sharing those expectations up front is a really important part about making the relationship work because it is a reciprocal relationship. It's not, as we said earlier, it's not one way. Um, and that means that both parties to the relationship need to make the time and the space. They need to be, and they need to be trustworthy and to respect the other person's time and space as well. So all of that comes from contracting carefully and Harriet's gonna talk about that much more in a little bit more detail later. So ultimately, if there is somebody at the center of the relationship, it's the mentee, it's, their, it's, you know, it's them that we're looking to develop. There are benefits to the mentor, but the focus should always be on, on the mentee. And if I can have the next slide then, please, um, that would be great. And as I've said, like a, a good, like any good relationship, um, effective mentoring relationships then offer this safe space um, to have an open and productive conversation. So creating that space does require work. It doesn't just happen and it's work from, from both parties. Um, it means being open about yourselves and about your, if you're the mentee, being open about your performance. Um, it, it's most effective if you both actively seek feedback, but particularly the mentor, but the, men, the mentee, sorry, but the mentor too. Um, and that you both listen thoughtfully, actively, carefully to, to what's the meaning behind the words, you know, not, not just kind of, you, you really hear what the other person is saying. Um, it's important too to acknowledge what your influences are, what your values are, where you're coming from. And then to, they, whilst your values might be aligned, you won't always agree about everything. So you have to maybe be willing to sometimes face into a little bit of conflict and to actually value the differences in, in perspective and viewpoint, because that's quite often where some of the best, as I'm sure you know, some of the best insights come from. Um, I think 
that active listening and that willingness to respect and value differences, for me, that's absolutely at the centre of any good mentoring relationship. And I think, too, thinking about the receiving of feedback. So we we often talk about giving feedback, but I think in the in the in the context of any good relationship, receiving feedback is often overlooked. But it's really really important. It's just as important as actually giving it, and that includes accepting gracefully complimentary feedback as well as feedback that might be a little bit more critical. Um, obviously here in through this scheme it's a, a national scheme and um, so it's not uh, particularly linked to one organization or one organization culture and some of you may have more or less open organizational cultures um, but really certainly within your you know and you might not be able to influence that but what you can do is make sure that within the culture of your you know, within your relationship, you avoid and you vigor vigorously resist any kind of sense of blame. Um, so, Lawrence, if we can go on to the next slide, then, please. Um, I think, as I said before, that mentoring, you know, there's benefits in it for everybody. Um, I think in a traditional mentoring relationship, the, the mentor's role is to help and develop the mentee's skills as they learn and develop. Um, and the mentee benefits from the guidance from someone usually more senior and experienced and from their support, from their time and from the space to have those conversations in what are often very, very busy organisational lives. But we shouldn't, though, overlook the the learning and the support that the mentor gets from the relationship. As I said, this is a cross organizational scheme. So if you don't find yourself um, in a developmental culture that's supportive of mentoring, um, I hope that won't apply to any of you. But you you know some some not all organizations have that more developmental culture. But it doesn't mean to say that you can't still have a productive mentoring relationship. It just, you know, it's up over to you then to make your relationship stand out, to be different and to show what can be achieved within your organisation through this more developmental approach. But I think what what's really important if you find yourself in that situation is that you pay attention to the context and you're open about it in your relationship with your mentor. So if we could have the next slide then, please, Lawrence. Um, so we're going to put you now, this is the first time we're going to put you into breakout groups. Um, before we do, we're going to put a link to something called a Jamboard. Um, if you haven't used a Jamboard before, it's a kind of space and you'll see down the left hand side that you've got lots of options of, of ways that you can contribute. You can upload photos. You can use stickies, you can insert text boxes. Um, and we're going to give you until um, 2.40, so about 15 minutes, to have a discussion in groups of typically four, just to go through quickly then what, um, what we want you to do in, in those breakout rooms um, is to, to share and to discuss the sort of images and the definitions that you've chosen in terms of like representing what mentoring means to you. Um, uh, and what you see as the important parts of that relationship, any common themes that are emerging from your conversation. So then once you've actually um, had a chat about the, the questions, you can just hopefully, assuming we can get the link to you, um, we could you we, you can add your reflections to the jam board.
so we've got some great images here. Anybody want to talk to um, the image? I like that thing. Was there's, there's one? I don't know if it's the same person who's got a, an image of two hikers side, side by side, and then there's some words that says that someone who's happy to come alongside you, they're not leading or following. Yeah, that was my my words and image, so they do match together. Um, and um, yeah, I, I I very much sort of like that someone who has trodden a similar path and can encourage you to pu push yourself and see the roots. But then we had a discussion about actually, does your guide need to have trodden a similar path? Actually, maybe they don't need to at all. They just need to be that person who listens and challenges you. Um, uh, and we had a discussion about mentoring versus coaching and um, and, and perhaps some of the differences. So um, so I, I've been thinking about that. Oh, I'm about to start thinking about that a little bit more. Thank you. Harriet, did anything emerge for you? Yeah, it was it was actually that um, uh, I think was it Victoria who was just talking there um, that that word those words push yourself. Um, it really stood out to me that this is um, about trying to um, to challenge in a really positive way and to to challenge ideas to um, see things from a different perspective. Um, I think that that sort of stands out for me in that particular part. Um, I liked the fact that there was an acknowledgement that the guide was smiling and the need for humour, which I think is a, a really nice human part yes. of what it means to be um, a mentor. And, and that sort of thing comes up in the reading that we'll share as well, that real relational part of friendship and how, how other things on the periphery of our lives get shared and how. Um, so it's all those nuances in those relationships that I think is quite nice to tune into. Yeah, and I, I I think that's true. There's lots of stuff in there, isn't there, about challenge. There's lots about guidance. There's growth. Perhaps I'm interpreting other people's images. But I think it's really important to think about these things because it affects what you do in your contracting. And I think, Harriet, you're going to you're gonna do a little bit on contracting and the ethics now, is that So, um, so our second theme just to dip into uh, today is around ethical issues and contracting. Um, and really, this is reminding ourselves that essentially everything in the mentoring relationship should be done by agreement. As Carol was saying at the beginning, this is about both parties um, within the within the relationship making that agreement. Some people are funny about this word contracting as well. So if you want to use the word agreement instead, sometimes it lessens the kind of feel of some sort of legal document. Um, so part of your preparation and getting started should be about making these um, sorts of agreements about all sorts of things from uh, how mentees and mentors might behave, logistics, um, understanding what's in and out of scope of the relationship. And this is also part of the, the, the trust building um, that goes on here. So these are the, the ground rules, if you like, of understanding and agreeing the nature of what your relationship will hold. Um, and this might be influenced by a variety of things, um, maybe how well you know each other already, what you might have in common, that relational aspect that we've talked um talked about before so really it's just sort of highlighting on this slide the certainly from a mentor perspective um it's worth thinking about this idea of client care um and the idea of professional conduct and what that actually means as a mentor and there's loads of useful guidelines that you can go and have a look at if you look at the emcc website if i had a chat button i'd stick it in there but it's the european and, and mentoring and coaching um, council. So uh, they're a great 
um, group to go and have a look at and understand a little bit more about um, what, what coaching and mentoring is, is all about. Um, there's also a lovely code of ethics that you might want to look at um, from the Coaching Federation. So coachingfederation.org.uk has a really nice um, code of ethics all about um, sort of giving you that place to start in terms of what it means to um, to consider uh, contracting and agreement making. And it's a good place to start to give you some sort of um, structure, I guess, to, to how you're going to agree things like confidentiality and privacy, um, how you're going to maintain records, um, keep notes, all that sort of thing. So you can see what that code of ethics um, and it's written, I think from memory, it's written really for people that there's a lot of um, mentor and client language, but you can adapt it to your sort of context. They're talking um, particularly about um, external mentors, I think, and, and those within organisations, but um, you can uh, play around with some of the language that they use, but it's a nice place to start, as I say. If we can go on to the next slide, um, please, that would be great. Um, so contracting specifically then, um, you would have seen in your pre-session workbook, there was a little section there uh, with a, a, a table in it uh, with three sections um, and a number of questions to get you thinking about how mentees and mentors establish uh, that full sense of understanding how the, and how the relationship might work. So these are the sorts of questions that you might want to, to think about. And there are just some examples here on this slide about how often you're going to meet and the, the logistics, um, how long they're going to last. Uh, you might want to think about where you're going to meet. And um, we're going to, um, in a future session, spend a little bit of time thinking about, about, that, uh, about that idea of space and, and holding a, a mentoring space. What does that look like physically, a physical space? How does that feel? What's appropriate, what's not? Let's unpick some of those ideas. And also thinking about that idea of virtual working that we're all getting so used to now. So thinking about those sorts of things, thinking about the expectations, which is what you might want to go back to the Jamboard. Uh, the Jamboard link um, that you've been sent now is, is live and can be um, edited uh, at, at any point, not just in this session. So you might want to go back to that and, and uh, have a think about what the expectations are. Um, specifically for, for this uh, relationship. Thinking about how you communicate between sessions. So it's not just about the sessions that you, you have together, but is there any communication in between? Um, are, and, and what are the boundaries there um, around texting, WhatsApp, email, getting in touch on the phone? Um, and, and is that in scope or out of scope of how you're going to agree that the relationship will run? Uh, and thinking about what will be helpful to discuss next time, making a plan, thinking about what the mentee might bring to the session. Um, so it's all of these sorts of things. Um, uh, it's worth thinking through. And, and there are more questions in that workbook that we sent through to you. So think about the boundaries uh, specifically, you know, as I say, what's on and off that agenda, how much we share. We might also want to think about the uh, the the relationship dimensions, and this is something that Carol is going to cover later on in the session. Um, but it's worth reflecting on that relational nature of the mentoring relationship and how that can facilitate this sense of friendship and connectedness. But what does that mean in terms of what we share and how we share it? Um, worth reflecting on why this is important in terms of um, mentors and their their well-being as well. This this management of of our own boundaries and recognising that it's OK to say no, it's OK to say that I don't know, and perhaps looking for alternative forms of support. So agreeing what it is that the mentor um, can, can identify and, and help with and support. Um, and recognising that it's mentee led in the sense that it's about the mentee bringing um, issues or particular goals to the session and whose responsibility, uh, the, the responsibility for that lies there. And of course, Issues can arise um, in all sorts of relationships like this, and it's often that often it relates to a lack of c clarity in terms of focus or, or, or goals. So it's worth spending a fair bit of time at the beginning establishing what that is, 
um, and what specifically the sessions are going to to focus on. It's it's really worth thinking about that. And of course, thinking about the goal or issue that you think might be the focus might not actually be the focus once you start talking about it. So, um, for example, if somebody wants to talk about how they might feel or experience more visibility in the workplace um, and getting more more recognition and and um, and that seems to be important to the mentee. But actually, if we unpick some of those ideas, it might actually be about growing or building a, a better sense of confidence in the workplace before that might happen. So it's worth spending some time really unpacking what that might be um, in your agreement making um, and making sure that you, you create moments for reflection, looking back and not being afraid to recontract that actually there might be a point where you need to renegotiate that agreement because perhaps the logistics aren't working or perhaps we need to reframe and refocus in terms of that that goal setting or identifying the issue at hand if we can go to the next slide that would be great please um, so you might also want to think about how we keep a record of conversations, um, reflections and action and how you feed back to each other. And this might be something that comes up as part of that agreement making. So um, on this slide, there are just some examples from my own experience. So please don't feel you need to do this sort of thing um, in your relationship. They, these, are these are just from my experience. Um, and these methods um, were used based on the contract and agreement I set up with my mentee based on her specific learning styles. It was important to her to be quite visual um, and to be able to see things written down and capture experiences and capture feelings in photographs or drawings um, and to make things. So and this was something that I did with her. So I also made things and took photographs and wrote things down. So we agreed that in terms of how we recorded what it was that we talked about, how we recorded our reflections as well, um, was in this sort of way. And that, that was a conversation that happened quite early on. So here my mentee was using, um, you can see that keep calm and carry on little book there, um, is a, her success diary. Um, and various other text based approaches um, to keep track of her progress and help her build her confidence. Um, and she used these approaches outside uh, the mentoring sessions, um, but often brought them to the sessions as a sort of aid memoir, talking point, evidence to refer back to and to have a conversation about. Um, so these were the activities that we sort of set up um, as part of that agreement making. And she also took some photographs as a way of documenting. Um, we were talking a lot of, at the time about work-life balance and she wanted to take photographs of what work-life balance looked like for her, um, part of the goals and issues for her. And, and they, again, in, in another session, we'll talk a little bit more about the power of visual and that it's not always um, talking based. Actually, we can introduce, as we've done already in this session, um, photographs and drawings and images perhaps to help us understand a little bit more about that individual's subjective experience to encourage that rich reflection um, and rich account of what it is that they might be experiencing or thinking about and these certainly for my mentee helped her articulate her feelings about work-life balance um, particularly when she struggled to explain how she was feeling about something it was tricky to just use words and actually using images uh, that she captured herself really allowed her to sort of engage in quite a, diff a, a different, deeper way um, on the topic at hand. So again, contracting well with that, with your mentee and using maybe some diagnostics with regards to learning styles perhaps might help you map out what might be, um, what approaches might be um, best for them and be aware of your own bias here. And I have to be aware of my own bias a lot of the time because I am a visual researcher and I use photographs and drawings in my research and a lot of my other work uh, is, is very visual so I have to be aware of my own bias here that um, that sometimes when people writing things down or putting things in an excel spreadsheet is perfectly okay whatever it is that works well for the person you're working with and you're making again that agreement um, so lots of tools and techniques that you can you can use and we'll as I say we'll have a look at some of maybe the visual arts based approaches in future sessions which can help people 
certainly articulate um, feelings and emotions in a different sort of way. But I wanted to share some examples there for you. So um, the next slide, if I may, please. So uh, finally then, and this often can get um, forgotten because obviously we're about to start, but you also want to think about how you're going to end the relationship as well. Um, so usually um, the end of a mentoring relationship is because uh, the scheme um, uh, that it's part of has, has come to an end. So rather than having some sort of awkwardness uh, at, at the end, discuss at the beginning how you might end that relationship. Um, and there's... Um, there, there's plenty of advice again if we go to the EMCC or if we go to the coaching federation um there is some interesting there were some interesting discussions there whether you're talking about coaching or mentoring about um how we might end relationships um so it's useful to uh particularly if things have gone well and things have been successful to to recognize that there's a sort of sense of celebration but also perhaps a sense of loss as well and to talk about that to recognize that that's that's um there might be some of the feelings that might arise um and try and think about this together um you're reflecting and commenting in a constructive way perhaps about how you've both handled the role um, and making some space to look back and review um, and think about how you might do that. So again, what's useful for both of you um, and particularly the mentee to, in terms of reflecting and drawing things together, we want to try and draw all of those threads together. What does that look like? So um, often with some of my um, mentees and with some of my coaches, um, I ask them to draw a, a picture of the journey uh, that they have been on. I know it's an overused word, um, but sometimes it's a nice sort of structure to then allow people to think about the time um, within that relationship and to identify the critical moments where they've noticed perhaps um, a shift in thinking or um, a new pattern of behaviour or a new tool and technique that they're going that they that worked really well or, or an experiment at work that, that seemed to go really well. And identifying those critical moments and thinking about um, what has been achieved, what have you learnt, um, and then thinking about the future, um, what other learning or mentoring needs there might be. So um, so that's just one way. I mean, we could ask people to take photographs, we can draw things, we can um, write out lists, we can compare and contrast before the relationship, during and after, lots of different ways that we can kind of approach that. But really thinking about um, making space at the end of the relationship to um, to reflect and to, to really think about what's been achieved um and what those critical moments are and how to move forward rather than simply just ending so the next slide please we're just going to uh, and, there, and there's a coffee break after this conversation um so if we um uh if we can go into our groups again maybe for uh about 15 minutes we'll ask you in your breakout groups to discuss what that contract or agreement making might look like. And you might want to refer to the list of questions in your workbook that you may well have made some notes against um, before this session. And think about some or all of these uh, questions on this slide about the ethical issues that you might face, um, the challenges with regards to boundaries. I know my boundaries, you know, and, and time keeping is tricky and I'll end up with a mentee for an hour and a half instead of an hour. Um, so actually, what challenges do, do, do you think you might face within uh, perhaps this relationship? What might the contract or agreement look like? And you might want to start drafting out an example. There might be questions and things on on in the workbook that we haven't covered. So you might want to sort of start adapting uh, your own. Um, and how will you know that it's working and keeping on track? And that sort of relates to this idea of how are we going to record things and be able to go back to things? Lots of good stuff happens in the room, but actually what happens outside of the room? Um, my mentee always used to talk about the fact that the journey home from a session um, in the car, there was lots of reflecting in the car. I'm sure lots of us have 
maybe we're not commuting now, but when we get in the car, that commute space allows for a bit of decompression, a bit of reflection, or where we're going to work, that allows us to sort of get set up for the day and we think about what we're going to do. So those in-between moments uh, in set with sessions is important and thinking about how we might keep on track and bring some of those back to the, the sessions. Um, so thinking about those reflective practices that you might put in place that might be useful to you. So I will hand over to Chalice. And so I'd just like to invite some reflections there from, from the group. Um, you've been spending some time thinking about your contracts and agreement making. So if you'd like to um, uh, unmute yourself, if you'd like to um, share some thoughts or reflections on, on what you were talking about with regards to some of these questions and agreement making. Uh, Cherry, I think it's yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, I, I suppose it's about confession time now. Uh, <laughs> you know, in terms of that, um, the contracting and the paperwork side of things, a lot of us found really formal mm -hmm. and not necessarily something in that we've had experience of whilst there might be paperwork, um, mm -hmm. that um, there's been a choice about whether or not to use it. Uh, you know, whether it is useful for the person or not. And just that the word contract, as I think you've highlighted anyway, mm. in terms of the fact it sounds really formal. And sometimes, you know, if you feel like you've set up a, or you feel like you have a good relationship with your your mentor, mentee, it almost feels slightly artificial to do to do that. And then we thought, well, is it the fact that we've been lucky so far and actually, you know, not fallen foul of putting a few more boundaries in or something? Um, so so anyway, that was part of the discussion that we had. That's really interesting. Yeah, and quite quite common. I think that comes up. We found that on our uh, Women in Research Mentoring Scheme that would come up. And so I guess the question back really to the group is, is how can we maybe make that less feel less artificial? Um, how can we make that uh, something that we do where um, agreements are, are simply made clear um, from the off without using language that makes us feel that it's artificial or some sort of legal document? I'm not sure if anyone's got any thoughts on that or if Carol, you'd like to chip in. Yeah, I, I, certainly something I've found in both mentoring and coaching relationships is, I suppose, if if your if your mentor is somebody you already know, maybe the tone can be a little bit more informal, but but I think actually having calling it an agreement, but having something, just having the conversation. Maybe you don't have to write it down, but quite often we think we've got the same expectations and a lot of things go awry because people have haven't voiced those things. So there is I think there's something to be said about just checking the, the, the person what the expectations are. And then say you've put you, you've got an agreement that your sessions will last an hour. When you get to 55 minutes you can you can see whether the other person has a bit of time or something I quite often do with with some of my coaching is I ask, I say people were going to have an hour but I've allowed an extra 15 minutes afterwards because you you know if that's okay with you so give yourself an hour and a quarter in your diary um, so I, th I think it's just been clear, Harriet, mm. whether it's whether it's formally written down. I think that's down to you, to you. But I think it is important to 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 just to talk those things through. As you say, it's having the conversation, isn't it? Yeah. And that was certainly evident in our group in terms of it may not have been the formalised thing, but it naturally came up those sorts of aspects. Um, and then we did have the discussion about how perhaps because we're all um, healthcare professionals, that there are certain things that we know through our, our sort of training and our relationships and, mm -hmm. and, and also how we work with our patients and our clients. Um, and that may be different when we go, if we were to mentor or have a mentee outside of our, our health environment, um, then that may be different. 
yeah that's a really good point actually i mean a lot of that that comes from from your tra professional training anyway so yeah lovely good points any other thoughts or reflections before we break for coffee hi this is Scylla. in our group we talked quite a bit about feeling that there should be some times you've agreed to meet as opposed to just expecting the mentee to contact you if they needed you mm. um, some someone had been given you know their, their mentor had said oh just contact me if you need me book in by my PA and that then made all the uh, responsibility on the mentee and they also felt like it had to be a really important issue they had to contact them about <laughs> so we agreed that we would definitely have a sort of um, number of times a year or whatever it might be that you were planning to meet and whether or not they could contact you in between that I mean I sometimes go for like once a term as a minimum but then people can contact me in between mm -hmm. um so we we talked about that uh, quite a bit as well and then we just started to get into ethical issues um and confidentiality is the only one we touched on which we recognize you'd definitely have to uphold mm. sure yeah no some nice reflections there I think um yeah about uh about that sort of regularity and and it, and it working for both parties in in some way but uh but yeah again part of that agreement making how often to to meet and what's useful for people uh like you say i think i think that is quite common you know that it's just a case of getting in touch with somebody just as and when it feels like it needs to be an important issue whereas actually simply just checking in with somebody it, it's it's that case of um the, the the issue that you think it might be isn't necessarily it it's something else and when you think there isn't anything important to talk about actually yeah, that's often where some when some things can come up and, and can be raised for discussion so it, it's um yeah it's important to have that regularity i think rather than sort of yeah like you say putting it all on mentee yeah that's really interesting what you've said because we talked a little bit around that and it isn't always the issue that people bring to you that turns out to be the thing needing to be thought about but mm. but we were um we were thinking people should have something they want to focus on yes. when they meet and that they have done a little bit of thought in advance. I, I once had someone who was very chaotic and they kind of often forgot the meeting <laughs> and and I kind of like re revisited the expectations a bit because I didn't want them to feel they had to meet with me if they didn't want to, you know, it's for them primarily. Um, so, yeah, so I think um, that's that's also, you know, in a way, important to establish and, mm. and you can go back and revisit those um yeah. so i think i tend to like say well obviously first of all we need to like think about expectations so we well matched and we know you know we'll be as effective as possible and everything and then i sometimes say oh, do you mind just jotting those points down in an email just so we've got you know both both on the same page that's how i do it yeah no, that's great yeah great advice yeah and then that fe that feels like there's an agreement there there's been a discussion it's been voiced You've had that conversation but yeah that's great thank you thank you all so we're gonna have a quick break for for coffee if that's okay um and carol has suggested seven minutes because she she told me how long it takes to boil a kettle which i thought was an excellent sort of gauge for how long we have um and we want to sort of claw back a little bit of time so in this last little bit i, I know quite a few people had asked if we could do um, something on different mentoring models and approaches. So we're just gonna race through a few. We're quite tight for time. So there's a couple of things in here, slides in here, I might um, just ask Lawrence to pass over. Um, they're quite text heavy, so they're fairly self-explanatory. And I'll race through this first one because when you get your mentoring um, pocketbooks next week, You'll, you'll see that this is one of the things that's covered in there. So it, it's just thinking about some of the dimensions that you need to be thinking about when you talk about the different approaches that you've got to mentoring. So they, they look at five dimensions. There's open and close. What's on the table for discussion? So the more open it is, um, that might be we can talk about anything we like. If it's closed, you might have very tight boundaries about what you you count as being in there's the public to the private and that's more around who who knows that the mentoring is happening um, what's important to think about here is that sometimes if we have our mentoring relationships are kept too quiet and they're not sort of people don't know that they're happening 
um, it can, people can often get the wrong idea and think there's something maybe a little bit untoward or underhand going on. Um, so, you know, like, it, think about it, but, you know, think about how public it, it's going to be. I mean, I guess this is a formal scheme. So in some senses, people, people know you're part of it. Um, and that leads me on to the formal and informal as well. So obviously, this is a formal national scheme. But within that, there's still scope, as you picked up on in the um, discussion just before the coffee break, about how formal or informal you want to have the, the relationship to be. So if it's very formal, that would be you have very clear boundaries around how often you meet, how um, what you talk about, how long the sessions are, where they are, and that's all pre-planned and pre-agreed up front. The more informal it is, the more likely it is that you might just kind of go with the flow and see what emerges and meet up. Um, too informal, sometimes things kind of peter out a little bit, as I think somebody else also uh, alluded to. So, you know, like it's what, thinking about what level of formality, what, what are the enabling structures that work for you in the context of that relationship? And then the next couple are the ones where we really do want to be a little bit more over to the left. And if we find ourselves moving too far to the right, we might want to think about, is this relationship really working? Or, and, and you know, at best, what can we do to get it on track? Or should we end it prematurely? So the active passive is who, who does what in the relationship and how proactive are we about it? If, the relationship becomes too passive on particularly if it's passive on both sides so you know nothing's really happening and I perhaps the mentor always waits for the mentee to contact them and then the mentee feels they haven't really got permission to do that you know I think you talked about having things in the diary some somebody mentioned that um, a little bit earlier so if things become too passive then the, the chances are the relationship will just peter out unless you do something about it. And then we have the sort of stable and the unstable dimension. Um, so that's thinking about, um, you know, are we trust, how trustworthy is it? How much trust is there in the relationship? And this can think about consistency, particularly important for the mentor to think about being consistent. So if, the, if you think the mentee is probably going through quite a lot of change and the more change we're going through, the more the consistency, the, the way that um, the person feels that they can guess at or predict at least with some degree of accuracy, how somebody is going to respond, then the more comfortable, the more trustworthy that relationship sees. So if, the, if if things become unstable and you lose that trust and consistency, again, it either needs to be tackled or you need to be thinking about, is this really relationship really working for both of us? So if you can go on to the next slide then, please, Lawrence. Um, there's umpteen mentoring models, although many of them are less formally expressed, they're not necessarily expressed as mentoring. And Caro, Caraccioli, I can never say his name, um, came up with this. He was around in the 18th century and he came up with this stage mentoring model. And although it's not necessarily explicit in a lot of more contemporary models, it tends to underpin quite a lot of more formal mentoring models. So he, he basically argued that there's six stages to mentoring. We go from observation through toleration through reprimand perhaps a more contemporary word might be you know the the sort of correct we move on to correction but that but the sort of the feeding back giving difficult feedback um, and then advice on how maybe to take more corrective action and then perhaps from there it moves on to friendship and at the end of the model, we've got awareness. So whatever approach you take within this stages, the desired outcome is also in, is always increased awareness. 
And he he suggested that within that, there were four different versions of mentoring that might help to sort of characterize different kinds of relationships. So the bending mentor tends to put the most emphasis on, on the toleration and, and, and being more tolerant. The stern mentor might be more in the reprimand and correction kind of stage. And I guess, I mean, somewhere I've come across this in work in the health sector is sometimes perhaps that might be a role that somebody takes if they're your they're advising on professional practice, for example. They, they might be focusing more on you know developing your practice and it might feel a little bit more like they're they're being quite stern at times. The friendly mentors, the kind of chatty, the person who sort of offers more friendship, more guiding hands, maybe it fits perhaps more with that flexible model. And then he he talked about something which originally came, I think, from Byron, which was about this implied uniqueness. So this is where the relationship means that the, the mentor and the mentee kind of find their own way. So they're not following specifically any particular model, but they're just kind of going with what what emerges for them. Um, but as I say, wherever, whichever of those approaches, the increased awareness, the encouragement of um, reflection that is development designed to to be developmental is where the relationships aiming to end up. And I think the next couple of slides are the ones I'm going to pass over. So there's a couple of slides, and we'll be sending the set out to you afterwards um, that talk about mentoring's do do's and don'ts, the etiquette of mentoring. And I'm I'm going to skip over those because. I think they're they're sort of pretty self-explanatory. They're fairly text heavy. But like this, the mentoring skills model here, um, they come from a, a woman called Phillips Jones. Um, and what what she argues is that there's some core skills that mentors and mentors need to have to make the relationship work well. Um, and then there are some aspects that are more or less um, important for the the, diff, the mentee or the mentor. So in that core, that shared core skills bit in the middle, and I referred to this earlier, for, for me, you can't have a good, effective mentoring relationship without active listening and without genuinely listening to what the person has to say. Um, a colleague and I did some research around um, mentoring and mentoring relationships a while back and something else that emerged was the importance of trust and also of whilst we might not always have the same viewpoint that there was enough shared values so that the mentor and the mentor the mentee are wanting the same thing from the relationship that they can that they believe that each other share, they have some sort of sense of shared values and coming from the same place. And, and that that might be expressed as well through identifying the, be, identifying the goals and the current reality and having some, some kind of level of shared understanding about what that looks like. Um, and obviously this notion that we both need to be open and encouraging in the relationship. So, so for the mentee, there's quite a skill in acquiring a, an appropriate mentor. Um, there is an emphasis on the ability to learn and to develop and to pick up and to work with the feedback, but also to kind of be selective about the, the, the feedback, the ideas, not feeling you have to follow absolutely. But when you do accept something and you think, yeah, I want to work with that, actually following through on it, not you know, not just letting it do. So it, really the mentee needs to do, in a sense, the managing the, the, the stuff about managing the relationship and, and delivering on, on that side of things. Um, for the mentor, there's, there's that whole emphasis on how do we develop capabilities? Because that's part, the important part of the role. How do we inspire this person to 
to be the best person that they can be. Um, I don't like this word corrective, but you know, there it goes. Providing constructive feedback, as I say, I like the, I like the phrase compassionate honesty, but being willing to, to say the difficult things that need to be said that perhaps sometimes, you know, people step, other people step back from saying, but always thinking that you're doing this with the, the mentee's best interests in heart. You're not trying to make them, a, um, if you're a mentor, you're not trying to make them a clone of you. But you are thinking about how can I, what can I do to support them in being the best that they can be? Um, it's also kind of the mentee's responsibility, perhaps, to manage the risks and perhaps the open doors, you know, particularly if you're somebody who's more senior in the organisation. Um, next slide, if we could then, please, Lauren. So, as I said, what's really important is no, there, there, there isn't really one right way to have a, a mentoring relationship. It is really about what's right for the two people involved in that in that relationship. And um, there's a, a Simon Weston did a bit, a bit of work who's come up with these sort of four boxes, um, four definitions, and then Garvey and some colleagues in. Have, have sort of split them into subjectivist and not objectivist. And I think it's quite helpful as well. We love a two by two matrix in business schools, and it's kind of like, you know, one of the things that crops up quite often. So I think thinking about, you know, what's the focus of the relationship? Is it more about the individual, which I think is perhaps what this um, ICA program is really thinking about you as an individual, or is it more at the organizational level? So we've got these four different broad categories of, of, of sort of relationship that, that might under, underpin your, your mentoring. Um, so if we're thinking at the subjectivist, from a subjectivist viewpoint, and we're thinking at the individual level, um, Weston calls these a soul guide. So that might be the emphasis in the relationship is more about working on the internal aspects of self so you'll be looking at kind of emotions feelings and what kind of meaning are we taking from from this sort of relate from the relationship um still at the individual level but perhaps taking a more objectivist approach is the style psychological expert so that be working on the outer self how do i present myself um so thinking more about what behaviour changes are needed, what skills developments are needed. And then if we're looking at something where the emphasis is more on an organisational level, but staying on that objectivist, so the bottom right box, this is increasingly on this right hand side, this is increasingly where a lot of mentoring is ending up and certainly schemes within organisations tend to earn, tend, often end up in this kind of more managerial space. Now you're cross-organisational, so that might not be the most appropriate thing for you, but that sort of objectivist organisational approach tends to be more managerial. And it then focuses on developing the person in their role and what their performance is like in that role. And there's maybe a bit more emphasis on measuring, on, you know, on, on goals and on, on thinking about how can we measure these outcomes and then finally if we're looking at staying at that more organizational level but being more subjectivist then this is kind of like the network coach space what Weston calls the network coach and that's thinking about the individual within as part of a broader system and the emphasis there will be on you know how do you develop and grow and extend that person's kind of networks and connections and their social influence across the system that they're part of. Um, so I hope that's given a bit of an overview. If we can go on to the next slide now, Lawrence. Um, I'm going to skip the discussion bit, but what I'd like you to do is take this away as something to do to find yourself a bit of a time and space to look back, to reflect on what you've learned from today, 
um, and think about, you know, if you if you did fill in the workbook, has anything changed? But most particularly, make a couple of commitments about what are you going to do in the next two weeks and what are you going to do in the next two months to try and make sure that you progress and get your mentoring relationship moving forward. OK, so Harry, um, if we move on then, Lawrence, and I'm going to hand over to Harriet to kind of wind things up. I will wind things up. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, so uh, a, a, a short piece of reflection then to just bring our thoughts uh, to a close from this session. If you could get a piece of paper in front of you and a pen, I would like you sort of A4 size. I'd like you to draw um, a balloon, a bottle and a bin. Enough so that you can write inside the balloon, the bottle and a bin. You won't be sharing these. Don't feel like anyone's judging your drawing skills. This is simply just an activity to um, help you help you help you just consider some things. So after all we've talked about today and uh, having looked at your um, uh, your booklet before your pre-session booklet and some of the notes that you've made in there and today we've looked at what mentoring might mean to you we've looked at contracting and agreement making and some of the frameworks and approaches that might help get you started in thinking about all of that and um, getting your head into that mentoring relationship whether you're mentee or mentor in the balloon we'd like you to write a hope that you have for your mentoring relationship. A hope that you have for the mentoring relationship, whether that's you as a mentor or mentee. And then in the bottle, we'd like you to write a message in the bottle, uh, a message to yourself. Um, and this might be about what you might commit maybe to the relationship, but it's a message to yourself. And then in the bin, something that you want to discard or throw away. So this might be a negative thought, an ineffective behaviour, a habit, something that you don't want to bring to the relationship, something you want to throw away. So hopefully that will give you um, uh, some reflections that maybe you can come come back to um, and it will give you something um, to think about ahead of getting into that effective frame of mind um, for all the mentoring relationships. So if we can go just to the final slide, I'm conscious of time. Our next session is on the 25th of May, so we look forward to seeing you then and some more. Uh, pre-session work and um, details around what will be covered then will be sent out beforehand. Um, we will be sending out the slides and uh, an interesting reading and any other materials that we think might be useful following up from today when we have a debrief as a team. I'm going to hand over to Alice in a second because she's got an announcement to make about the uh, mentoring pocketbooks. But before we go, we just wanted to make some space if there were any questions uh, that anyone wanted to ask. And, and Harriet, I, I yeah. think I know you've got to dash off, but I can be around for a few minutes afterwards. So if anybody has got a question that's not relevant to the rest of the group, something more specific, then I'm sure Alice and I can stay on the on the um, on the on the call for a few minutes after it's finished. Sure. OK, well, I shall um, I'll hand over to um, to Lindsay and Alice to to, to wrap up with some of uh, the housekeeping. Um, but it was a pleasure to to see you all today. We look forward to meeting you again. Um, I'm going to have to dash because I've got another session to run on another team's call. Um, but uh, but lovely to see you all and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thank you.
Thanks all. Hi everyone. Um, I just want to say in relation to the pocketbooks, um, we have taken all your addresses and next week we're planning to um, package them up and send them. So in the next couple of weeks, hopefully you'll get those pocketbooks. But if anyone hasn't sent me their um, address, um, I'll be happy to note it down and put you on the list to receive a pocketbook. If you could do that by next week, that would be really good. And this presentation is currently being recorded. We're going to send you all the slides uh, anyway, but this recording we're going to create an MS Teams channel. So we're going to put all the future webinars, including this one on there, so you can look back and watch. So, yeah. Thank you. It just remains for me to say thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you especially to Carol and Harriet for the excellent presentations that they've given us. Um, and uh, thank you, yes, for, for Lawrence supporting us in the background as well. So thank you from all of us in the, at the University of West of England. Thank you also to the steering group that supports this work. So we hope that you've got something from today. We look forward to um, seeing you again in the future. And don't hesitate. Any questions at all, please just send them via the uh, website, the, the email address icamentor.ue.ac.uk. We'll pick those up and respond to them as soon as we can. Thank you for joining us today. And goodbye.